So my name is uh, Martin Phils. You don't need to have all of the initials and everything, but it's my parents. That's my parents' fault. And I am the owner operator of a small company called Toronto Fitness Associates. Uh, right now, because of COVID, I really only have one employee who's teaching yoga for me at my condo clients. Otherwise, um, I used, usually have a, a four or five different instructors working for me all around. I am not a brick and mortar business like like yours, Martin, right? It's it's mm-hmm. very much uh, spread out. I go to places and actually formulate fitness programming. So the one client, for example, uh, is not only uh, Pilates on land, but uh, yoga as well. And then Aquafit as well as another skill of mine too, the teaching. And I actually translate a lot of Pilates into the water Okay. as well too, when, when I'm whenever I'm teaching but it's been I haven't taught an aquafit class since March again because of COVID and pools are not really are not really open and if yeah. they are open in a very socially distant way so you couldn't really have any any classes so yes uh, that's basically the scope of my business and then the other half of it is that I work for an institutional client I work for the University of Toronto specifically uh Heart House, which is a student uh, student center, student focus center. Um, people who are not familiar with the the layout of U of T's, we have three main campuses in the city of Toronto. There's one out by you in in Mississauga. There's one in Scarborough as well, and then there's downtown. And downtown is serviced by the uh, Department of Kinesiology and Physical Education, so KPE, and is also serviced by Heart House. And our emphasis is not so much on intramurals or anything like that. It's more student development, student community, uh, student recreation. So there's no pressure. You don't necessarily have to compete with with, uh, top flight university athletes, you know, but you can come in, relax, enjoy. We have... uh, I know that it's not favored to be, but it looks like a giant castle on campus. If you, yeah. if you ever, if you've ever been to Heart House. So, uh, and people have called it Hogwarts in the past, but it's, it's, it's all in love. People really do. Once they get into Heart House, they really enjoy, enjoy the space. So. Amazing. And, you know, and this, my bricks and mortar space is a partnership I just got into in July. Like this is a go COVID baby behind me, right? Like we, um, uh, I, for since 2002, like you, more of an almost consulting based model where I was going to people and had some, you know, contracts and stuff. And I love that. I really felt like that was, um, that gave me the freedom to, to flow within my passion and not feel bogged down by overhead and trying to keep the lights on and, and that sort of thing. Right. Well, there's still, there's still overhead because I mean, um, hopefully you weren't doing that all by yourself because that's an absolutely, uh, yeah, huge task okay so managing subcontractors and employees again still you have to be able to do that and then put them where they're most needed and where they'll generate the best revenue for you as well too i mean yeah. I'm, as, as altruistic as we are about going into fitness we also have to be we have to we do have to keep the lights on we have yeah. to feed ourselves and keep a roof over our head too so we have to think of all of those things as well yes that uh you know and it's funny you say that because a lot of times we think about the altruistic side and we don't get into it for the money side, but that is a reality of it. How do people like, what do you recommend for finding that balance between the two? Well, it's hard. First of all, I think that you should be, you should be, if you're going to do fitness, whether it be Pilates or whether it be any sort of of fitness, I also deal with a a senior's clientele as well too. Um, You have to have a passion for it. If you don't have a passion for it, if you're there just to make money, you will burn out very quickly. Yes. And you will not have the lasting power to do this. I've been in business for myself like this since 1992. I started yes. exercise instructor in 1988. I'm an old guy <laughs> doing it. Okay. But yeah. Um, and uh, um, you just have to have the passion for it. I was, and I'll, and again, I think the story is quite relevant to what we're saying. That's my wife um, who's like, Never <laughs> yeah. the, the novelty hey, of uh, yes, Martin Pilates. <laughs> having, having on Martin yeah. Square. I have I have one cousin who's also Martin, the first cousin. Okay, well. oh, go. <laughs> yeah, so there's there's a few of us around. Right. It's a tr- Martin. You'll find at least in the Caribbean is a Trini is a Trini. You'll see more Martins in Trinidad than yeah, and also in Saint Lucia. Yeah. Um, than any other place in the Caribbean, I think more than any any other, m- yeah. maybe any other island. But anyway, getting getting back to it um you really 
you know, I started off as a molecular geneticist. That's what I got my undergraduate okay. degree in. Yeah. All right, in virology and stuff, and it just wasn't for me. I'm not as much as I was doing very well. Working in a lab would leave me ill at the end of the day. Okay. Right, sitting in front of a screen all day, uh, even back then, and those screens were worse than what we have now. Would yeah. leave me feeling ill all day. And I started at the end of my undergraduate career teaching fitness. I said I can do this, and we'll maybe talk about this uh, later on in the conversation, but. You know, I started and I realized I have a passion for this. It's not something my father, who uh, was a surgeon and trained PhD, he was an oncologist, went to Germany. That's another story, you know, if we're talking about black success. Yes. And my mother, again, also uh, a master's in education and a wow. you know, roasted level of VP. But really her passion was teaching and she's been teaching really all of her life since um, the age of 15, you know. But again, in all of the, the hurdles that they had to go through as people arriving here in the 50s, um, that's, that's another line of conversation. We can have a whole hour conversation about that. I know. That. I'm like writing down they, the lines. We've got to go. <laughs> but they wanted, they wanted their son to be a doctor. Or, you know, my mother said lawyer. My father said, no way you're going to be one of those people. Right. But, and as it turned out, I, didn't, I, I took the teaching path that my mother, that my mother uh was in, but in physical health and education. And I remember having a, a conversation with my, my dad much later on. And, you know, I said, I want to keep people out of your office. That's my job. Yeah. My job is to keep people healthy and to keep people out of your office so that the, you don't have to work with them. And I'm, I'm that sort of linchpin in the, in the system. And he understood that. And he really began to appreciate what I did, especially towards the end of his life when it was a lot of help for him as well too yes, so yes so wow. um yeah that's you know but you have to have a passion for it. getting back to that you need to have a passion you'll burn out otherwise right. so follow your passion and it doesn't matter whether it's fitness or or aviation or whatever uh -huh. you have the passion for it you'll have the staying power and you'll you'll then develop the resilience and the wherewithal to carry carry yourself forward. If you don't, if you, like I said, if you're going into fitness for the money, because people s see what some personal trainers charge, yes. for example, and it's a big, you know, they're, they're just lifting weights and they feel, oh, I could do this, blah, blah, blah. And then once they get into the whole rigmarole of it, they drop off like flies. And I'm sure both you and I in my career have seen so many yes. people go through that route, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And passion, I love talking about passion because it really is, like an all-consuming fire. Absolutely. And, you know, the passion, it drives you to do the things that you love and it gives you that, that, that momentum when the times you don't feel like doing it, but it also gives you courage. And there's times when, you know, and we both know this from the, the fitness industry, there's times when you have to ask people for money or there's times you have to give a recommendation. There's times you have to do certain things that usually would be uncomfortable, but because you're driven by your passion to help people not end up in the doctor's office or to help them lose that weight or whatever it is, it gives you that little bit of, of, of oomph to be like, okay, this is what you need and I can help you get there. I'm not going to get you there, but I can come alongside you in that, in that path to get there because this is how much I love what I'm doing. Yeah, no, I agree with you 100%. But here's, here's a caveat to that. And this is very specific to both you and I, again, being black men in a predominantly white, white society, again, is that, you know, you run the risk. And I, certainly, I've been a victim of this to some degree of imposter, imposter syndrome, right? Okay. You feel there's a concept um, that in diversity that we we haven't even touched on at, at the university yet but because I have the, the friend who took my picture is also in charge of a diversity office and this is a friend that okay. I've had since we were 11 and he's actually white he's not he's not black but he's in charge of it and he brought up a, a concept called psychological psychological safety okay this is an interesting thing here so you, we talk about sensitive, the uncomfortable topics like asking for money. This is our rate. This is yes. what we do. And, you know, you have this imposter syndrome because you, you, you are the only one of your type in your field, yeah. of your color. And then when it comes to asking money, well, you know, you're probably actually more qualified and better qualified than your colleagues, right? Mm -hmm. But it, you, you, you hold back. There, it prevents you from actually valuing what you do and valuing your own worth in the business. So you end up undercutting. 
Right. And, you know, it's something that, that I think we all do, particularly uh, those of us who are of color, right, uh, BIPOC of any type. We tend to do that because we there's there's that feeling, oh, well, that maybe we're not that worthy. But in re- reality, we're more than worthy. We're more than right? worthy. More than worthy to to qualify and ask for the rates that we should be asking for. So I think, yeah, um, I really have to put that caveat on. I think that those of us who are BIPOC really have to uh, understand that we belong. We're there. We're qualified. We might even be overqualified in comparison to our colleagues. And if we feel that this is the rate that we should be getting that's fair, you need to ask for it. And yes. you need to say, this is what I charge. And if, you know, sometimes it means if they don't like it, they will walk somewhere else, but then they won't get the quality of, of work that, that yes. and passion that we both have for, for our absolutely, field. Absolutely, absolutely. You say overqualified. Last week in my Finish Strong Friday post, I said uniquely qualified. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I think so. And I, I'm, I'm remembering that now, actually. Yes. Yeah, you did yeah. say uniquely qualified, and that is a very, very good. Fo- and that's true. Of that, that could be universally applied. Really, everybody's that's, uniquely qualified. Absolutely. And that's, and that's exactly why I use that, because as much as I like the dialogue about people of color and our, our, our experience in this hue, everyone has universally some challenge and I like to just draw it across every line to be like, you know, you also are uniquely qualified to do what you are called to do. So equality comes into play when it's like, well, it, in spite of my skin tone, I should be able to do what I'm uniquely qualified to do. And that's where institutional racism comes in when they're trying to literally roadblock that from happening. Agreed. I mean, you, 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 there's no walking around that. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons why my, my life is so bilateral, if you will, in terms of having, you know, a, a company corporate side that I deal with, and then actually having an employer as well that I deal with too, because again, they're glass ceilings. So you can't, you can't walk around that. There are glass ceilings. I know that, you know, particularly, I don't want to speak too much to it, but really in my position, there's a glass ceiling. There was a glass ceiling. And then when COVID came around, I hit that glass ceiling very, very hard. Mm -hmm. Right? And really had to start looking at rebuilding uh, a whole set of business because a whole chunk of income just went belly up. Yes. Right? And, you know, couldn't be repositioned or anything for various and sundry sundry reasons. But, yeah, that was was tough. Yeah. Um, and I think that a lot of people of color went through a lot of that too, right? Right. That they're working alongside their colleagues and all of a sudden they're dropped and everybody else is, is continuing to move forward. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it really, I think that, that the, the times that we're in now are a, a real wake-up call. I think they're a real wake-up call for particularly people of color, black people in particular, and let's be highly specific, also yeah. indigenous people as well too, that I think that's important uh, yes. that, they, that they find their voice and they find their space. But, you know, for us, we've been through uh, a, a fair bit and we get clobbered oftentimes when things go really south. Yes. Right? There isn't... Yeah. There, there isn't the room almost for us. We have to kind of make our space again. Right. And I think that you're doing that very successfully. That's why I'm very honored to be, to be interviewed by you oh. and, you know, seeing, seeing your success. And then, you know, again, for me, rebuilding my business, uh, my business model and looking into the future was something that's going to be a little bit more, you know, I have to think for myself sometimes <laughs> rather than thinking of, again, the altruistic greater good of, yes. of fit, right? There's, yeah, there's got to be a balance. Like I'm, uh, have you watched, I, I want to get to Caroline's comments here in a second, but have you mm. watched uh, Black Godfather yet on Netflix? No, not yet. Okay. It's on my list. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm often tired at the end of the day, I want to turn on the TV and I just, you know, it's time for bed already. <laughs> it's watching you <laughs> instead of you watching it. <laughs> the uh, So as I, I, I'm still musing on, I had this conversation with my wife yesterday about it and there's so many nuggets in that in terms of what Clarence Avant did. But one of the things that uh, really resonated with me was the fact that in a time that was even more overtly racist than now, I mean, it still, it was, but I think it was more overt in that time. Um, People said, you know, he was able to not be one of those people who sat back and said, well, the man's holding me down. He went out and got it anyways. Yep. And I think that that's the thing that we have to do. We have to go out and get it for ourselves. 
Yes. You can't you can't sit back and say, oh well, yeah, the man is the man has his thumb, you know, his thumbs pushing down on the top of our head. Yeah. This is not happening, right? We have to just push that hand aside mm -hmm. and get it ourselves. It's really that's really we have to we we can't we are victims. Let's let's not uh, diminish that in any way, but we have to kind of throw off the vi victim mentality and move on and and right. take what we need to take for ourselves and for our own well-being, mental health as well. Mental health as well. So now for the person in the U.S. who's watching this or overseas or watching, because people are from all, all over the place when they watch these, they may say, well, you guys are in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you know, there's some advantages to that. You know, my parents are, were very, very grateful for being able to come to Canada and do what they did, even though, um, now, mind you, if they stayed in Trinidad, they would have had the same level of success, I would imagine. Okay. Um, but they wanted to, they wanted to leave a smaller country and find opportunity somewhere else, which I think was something that was promised to the entire world post-World War II. Okay. So, yes. so, um, they came to they came to Canada and they ran up with a, a whole number of roadblocks, but they succeeded. I mean, again, they didn't take the victim mentality. It was hard. I mean, it was hard on the family. Even uh, eventually, my parents even you know had divorced. Okay, they were separated mm -hmm. and yeah. and divorced because of the difficulties of of managing. I think a lot of things and and then my father having to go away to Germany to get a PhD and then coming back and then having to do you know postdoctoral fellowship in in Manitoba and so on. that that yeah. takes a lot of things because again you know and these were roadblocks for him they yes. you know top of the class of the year that he graduated one of the top in the class and not admitted to med school here. Mm -hmm because that quota had been reached, <laughs> right. Yes. right? And there are a lot of other people who are, who are in that boat in the late 50s as well, but he just took those and said, well, you know, they're willing to pay me to go to Germany, so I'm gonna go. And there is Max Planck Institute at Heidelberg University and, and voila. So, you know, you have to, you just have to push aside those thumbs as we were saying before. Yes, yes. And, and yeah. forward. Right, yeah, and that's a conversation I'm having with my boys a lot recently you know like there's still there are more barriers to push to but we can still get there mm -hmm. so it's almost like preparing bracing them for impact because it's not going to be as smooth as they, as they thought but it's not impossible as the world would make you think that it is no it's not impossible you just have to you just have to go do it i mean in in my parents generation you know the idea was and i still think it's true that if you are black you have to be you have to be twice as good mm -hmm. you know as as your and de demonstrably type as twice as good as your fellow before yes. before you're being recognized right it's not right. it's not as easy uh you know i'll do well i'll get good marks no you have to be exceptional to be exceptional in everything you do in order to be to be recognized it's not it's not easy i think it's a little bit easier a little bit easier now for mm -hmm. the younger folks but again still why are they up in arms for black lives matters because they're feeling that they're not being recognized for their value and their worth right so yes exactly and that recognition is so important but to our, our american friends yeah canada canada is was far and away better, but the problem with Canada is that a lot of it was uh, overt or um, covert, yeah. covert, not overt. Right. So there were a lot of a lot of things. We were lucky though that you know our leadership, particularly in the '60s and in the '70s. I mean, people like Trudeau, people like Craigchamp, Champ, people like Pearson, yes. and that were valued us being here. It was a matter of the rest of the sure. the rest of the population who was here to kind of catch up and they're still they're still catching up in many respects. I mean, we live in a very cosmopolitan city, both you and I. I mean you're in the, the West End, I'm I'm central, um, very cosmopolitan. There are over a hundred countries represented in fairly substantial numbers here. Yes. Um, but yes. it still doesn't prevent, you know, brutality from happening. It still doesn't sure. prevent uh, doors being closed or glass ceilings being hit. Yes. So it, it's it's ongoing. It's an ongoing, ongoing right. struggle. <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, a conversation I was having with uh, Kara, um, I, I guess you know about there's a sense also because of the the culture that we're in where there's a novelty at the same time for for being 
a male in Pilates, a black male in Pilates, or like, you know what I mean? Like that sort of thing. So I always look for ways where, where I can leverage this at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, because, I agree with that. You know, yeah, technically we're, you know, we, we are, we have that skill set. And, you know, people have said on the show too, they have to get seven, eight, nine, ten 10 certifications to see their counterpart with like one certification on the board when they're doing their, their bios next to one another and they're all at the same job, right? So we all have so many unique skill sets and so many extra qualifications just to be at the same level that like, now I'm like, well, I'm going to leverage that since I'm the only brother doing this. Let me. Well, and and you have to. There's just no no way to do it. I mean, some of us have enough letters behind our names to have our own alphabets if we wanted, right? So, yeah, uh, yeah. you know. Uh, and certainly, I have I have certs from every, everything possible. Not everything you can possibly imagine, but you know, even going up to the highest level of the Ontario Fitness Council here as an RHEP, um, and you know, being able to to prescribe levels of exercise as well, you know, with the Pilates specialist, with yeah. with all that sort of thing, so that you know, and and really eminently qualified, but but still, it's a struggle, right? It's not yeah. the people are not going to hand things to you. That's for sure. You have to really have to right. you have to go and get it. Exactly. And just to qualify this too, like this is not a woe is me conversation. This is a, no, it's not. we are totally <laughs> rising up and moving forward and just celebrating our gifts and talents in this moment because exactly. there are so many people out there like Caroline's in Ger Germany right now. Like Kira Lamb just came on as well. Like there's some great movers and inspirational people that are in this space um, that are doing awesome things, man. So it's, it's really cool. Uh, one of the things too that, that came out of that uh, Black Godfather comment uh, show, which I just, it jumped off the page and it was kind of like a side conversation. They were saying in New York in like the 70s when there's like a lot of stuff was happening, same as today, but like more riots in Detroit and all these different things. They were talking about Soul Train and how that show really took off, not just because of the dance and the highlighting movies and uh, people and their dance moves and their new music, but the way they said it was the best remedy for the black plate was joy. Absolutely. Love oh, so great. let me tell you, we would every Saturday afternoon, the TV would be lined up and, you know, sitting with cousins or sitting, you know, by myself or sitting with my, my mom or my dad. Soul Train was on. Yes. Big time. <laughs> Big time. Big time. I'm aspiring to get that. Yeah, that that's a cool It's yeah. coming. It's coming. <laughs> Must be nice to still have an option, man. My Afro would be like back here starting right now. <laughs> oh, Lord. Yeah. Well, there's there's good and bad. I've gone through like five comb sizes so far to be able to manage this hair. Plus a pick. Yes. Black people problems, everybody. Right, exactly. Yes. <laughs> um, but, so, Joy. I love that concept of joy. And, and I find for myself now, I don't know if this is the same for you, but I'm reaching for those moments to, to you know, like, to just celebrate, right? Well, listen, this class that I taught this morning is the first class of the week for me. It is a lot of joy. All of the classes that I teach are joy. The appreciation that you get for the work that you've done for people, the yeah. thank yous, all of that stuff. That you know, just helping people on a daily basis, even though you can't be with them physically, yes. right? Now, most of us have moved to to uh, moved our work to online. That is a huge source of joy. I don't think that if 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 I wasn't getting joy from that sort of work, I don't think that I would be in the business period. Right, right? exactly. That, that's the thing. And, you know, despite all the hardships and everything else, uh, joy from my clients, joy joy from seeing them accomplish things and discover things about themselves that they would have not had the opportunity if they weren't working with me. Um, you know, there's okay. just, there's so much to draw joy from. And as... Uh, physical practitioners, you know, we are in, you know, let's not, uh, fitness business, yeah, but we're in the wellness department. We're here about keeping people well. When people leave our workouts feeling uh, physically challenged, but feeling good, right, and they yes. feel mentally good, yes. right, all of those things, you're contributing to somebody's life. You know, um, 
fitness could be the line between life and death for some people. It could be the psychological line between between mental health and mental illness, right? Yes. So it's right. the, there's so much joy that can be extracted from from just doing our work. And again, it, it all circles back to passion. It does. It right? Does. You will get the joy from the work if you have the passion for it. If you don't have the passion for the work, it will not be joyful and you won't last again very long because it's hard work. It is really hard work. And when you think of, you know, managing personalities, particularly yeah. if you manage a facility or manage a, a large group of people, mm -hmm. uh, managing the personalities then of your clients yeah. as well, and working with those personalities, mm -hmm. uh, there's so many opportunities for conflict but because of the work that we do, and it makes people feel better, those opportunities for conflict really just kind of go by the wayside. And it is all about joy, joy of accomplishment for the yeah. clients, uh, joy, joy of, of, of that altruistic sort of joy that you've helped yeah. somebody yeah. achieve their goals. And, and it's, it's, you know, it, I can't say enough about joy. And, and I'm glad that you brought that joy up because again, I think that for both you and I, it's something that keeps us going yes. and keeps doing what we do. Absolutely, absolutely. And there's a joy that I felt this morning with my first client as he, um, he used to, we used to train with his older son. So the two of them, and I, I first I commend him for making this time for his kids in his time. Um, and now as his daughter's gotten older, she joined us for a couple of Pilates sessions, group sessions, and now it's just him and her. So I have this Indian gentleman who brings in his teenage daughter at 6 a.m. for a wow. Pilates class. Let that sink in for a second, because one, oh, okay. I don't know how many, how, many, how many guys can get their daughter to do anything with them still when they're a teenager let alone at six o'clock in the morning for a Pilates class, right? And then you layer in cultural differences and all these different things like this. I, I can't like commend uh, this guy enough. Like he's a client and a friend and just, just props for being able to just connect with these kids and be intentional with that time. It brought me joy to see that this morning because I'm always challenged to find ways to connect with my kids. And when I see him doing that, I'm like, that's, that's what's up. Like, that's, that's really good. How is that connection with with your kids going? Are they are they interested in taking a Pilates route? Uh, how's that been going? I wonder. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they they love movement. They're good athletes. Like and my stepkids as well. Like you know my 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 stepson is a good hockey player, and like so they all love movement in their their own way. Um, but that kind of lends to the conversation, you know, if you think about back in the day, you, your kids would like what well, your parents did to you, like, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a lawyer. Like this generation, I wouldn't I really think to say to my son, you are going to be a plies instructor, you're going to continue the business. And, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah it's the same, it's well, okay. there. So, <laughs> but here's the thing. So I think that uh, certainly with me, so we can talk about the younger generation too, because sure. I think it's a little bit important here because generally, I mean, with exceptions like your family and, you know, my, my godsons as well, though they're a little bit older now, um, most of the younger generation comes into it very deconditioned. Either that or, or sports and rec, uh, or exercise was used as a babysitting method as one of the many sort of over-programmed things that kids weren't allowed really to do. They, were, yeah. they weren't allowed to play and be right. physical movement and natural movement, but instead they were programmed into this program. And so they develop a distaste for it. So yeah. when, I, when I get them, you know, as first and second year university students, they're very deconditioned. And then they're moving towards that ac academic sphere. So when you demonstrate to young people, I find that... Um, that what you do, for example, in Pilates form, uh, uh, studio, what you do in the reformer is going to benefit your sport. Okay. Right. Yeah. And they actually see the results right away because you, as you know, as well as I do, you put somebody on the reformer for a couple of sessions, all of a sudden their performance goes up. All of a sudden they're able to walk properly or walk yes. groundedly. All of a sudden they're able to move around without pain. Right. Mm -hmm. You see this in all the clients, regardless of, of age. So, um, once you once you show them and they see for themselves that A, it's fun, and B, 
it will really help them in all aspects of their life, whether they're studying, whether they're they're pursuing another athletic uh, uh, athletic stream or whatever. Yeah. Okay, then then it's a very easy sell, and then not only that, and they start telling their friends, right, to come, right, yeah. and it becomes a bit of a snowball too. But you just have to break through that first little that first little bit. Yes. Is that the, thing, the only advice that I could give you? Just no, having true. university children for children. They're they're young adults. Working with university young adults, you know, late late teens, early twenties now for decades. Just that's also very very important. Right. I, I talk business strategies with everyone who comes on here. You know, how do you get men into Pilates? How do you get so and so? All those different things, and everyone lands at the same line. You just have to feel it. I agree with that 100%. But again, to feel it, they have to come in and do it. They have to come in and do it. <laughs> okay. So remember earlier in the conversation, we talked about, again, that, that concept of psychological safety. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, for black men, there's that peer pressure. Well, you know, that's girl stuff, in particular Pilates and so on. But again, if you relay it to their sport, and not only that, you show them that some of the, some of the best basketball players in the NBA are doing Pilates. Right. Some of the best football players in the NFL, yep. Pilates is part of their regime, right? Yes. Some of the best uh, uh, performing athletes, uh, you know, Olympic level athletes, Pilates is part of their training, okay? Right. And they're all on the, and it's all on the apparatus, not even the mat work, all on the apparatus doing usually the reformer, but sometimes the Cadillac, sometimes tower work, right. pardon me, spring walls, all of those things, right? And they, right. and they see that, you know, the, these guys, these stars are actually doing this, then the conversation changes into when I can, when can I start with you? Yes. Right. But it's to get them into the studio first. And, you know, you have to kind of push apart that, that peer pressure. Stigma. That this is not a manly thing to do. Right. Right. That's kind of, there's a toxic masculinity that kind of prevents guys from actually doing what's good for them. Right. Right. And, and get them into the facility, get them, onto the apparatus, get them feeling good, yes. show them that other people of, that they worship are actually doing the same thing, yes. right? And then you break down those barriers, but you have to get through that. And that's the tough part. I think particularly for black men in uh, remedial fitness sort of regimes like Pilates and that sort of thing, it's tough. Everybody wants to go into the gym. They all want to use their prime movers, right? right? Yeah. Meanwhile, yeah. they're destroying all of the, stabi the stabilizing muscles. Their backs are going to crap. And yeah. then we, we find them as a crumple heap. They come into our offices or our, our, our facilities yeah. broken, right? right? Yeah. And, you know, but if we can get to younger black males and say that you don't have to be broken if you do this all the time. Right, exactly. It really makes, big, makes a big difference. Right. And uh, can you speak to the mental health component of it too? Oh, absolutely. Jeez. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think that's the, well, I mean, certainly listen for me, when I started, you know, way back in the days of aerobics, this was before, I mean, I didn't start getting into Pilates until the nineties, the but in the eighties yeah. when I was doing fitness classes, all of a sudden when I started joining fitness classes and before I started teaching them, my marks went through the roof. All of the stress, all of the the anxiety, right, yes, yes. was washed away. I would go, I would do an aerobics class, and then I would uh, do my weights afterwards and then go right back to the library. All of a sudden, I'm efficient. All of a sudden, I'm working. Oh, it's 12, it's 12 midnight. Oh, things are closing now. I need to go home, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. Getting all of this stuff yeah. done. Yeah. So the value, the value for mental health is there. And if I didn't do fitness, I don't think that I would be <clears throat> as positive or as, as resilient as I am now, because the, 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 it's just one of those things in the, the sort of the toolbox that you need in order to keep good mental health. Even now during lockdown, as much as I'm teaching class and stuff, I will still take the hour, go for a walk. Walking is one of the best ways, low impact. Again, at my age, do I really want to be doing, you know, uh, uh, CrossFit <laughs> or anything like that? And I get way too many CrossFit, again, people who are ending up on my, on my uh, you know, in my docket because they're injured, right? But right. take a nice hour-long walk, a nice good tempo walk, good tunes, whatever you like listening to, and totally de-stress. Uh, and I have to say that... Exercise and 
it accounts for 80% of it has been the reason why my mental health has been so good yeah. during this time. I mean, there has, there, I can't say that it's been problem free. Mm -hmm. That's a lie to say that, <laughs> but, but well, no, let's, let's, let's be frank, but it's been good and resilience has been high because of the exercise. Yes. that I do, whether it's teaching Pilates classes, mat classes, working with clients, and dedicating some time to myself where I just... Yes. Where well, I just actually... That's the concept, like you said earlier, about making space, right? Like, we need to continue to make that space for ourselves because um, we're so good at making that space for our clients and just giving them that room, giving them that joy, giving them that laughter, or whatever it is, because we could see that. We could read that on them and feel okay. Someone walks into my space and I go, okay, I'm going to kill them today. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> right? We're all at that moment, right? We're like, okay, I'm going to let you talk for 25 minutes. We're going to do a couple of things and you're going to feel just as good as if we completely crushed the workout. And for their mental state, that was equally as effective. Yeah. No, I, I, you, you hit the nail on the head. You have to take the time for yourself. <clears throat> There's, you know, one day last week where, you know, I didn't take the time for myself. Freely admit it was Thursday last week. Okay. And yeah. it was a very busy day mm -hmm. and I was flat out exhausted. Yes. Right. And I said, you know what? I will never do that again. I will make the time even if it's a half hour, I'm going to get outside. I'm going to move around outside, have all the green. I'm very fortunate to be living where I'm living, uh, where I'm basically in the heart of the city and in the middle of a forest, right, with yeah. ravines and everything else. So I'm very, very – I don't know if you can see some of the green in the background. I there. can, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> but, it's calling yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, but to make that time. Yeah. Otherwise, you just – again, you're going to burn out. You won't last. Right, right. And, and you know, and, and, and go ahead. Sorry, and, sorry. And, and real talk, like I mean, like last Thursday was uh, was pretty dark for me as well. And I think that a lot of last Thursday was the news from last Wednesday around Breonna Taylor and and, and how oh, that case God. went, and you know, and things that like Trump had said, and like there's a lot of stuff that was happening that I had to just regulate in a different way coming into Thursday and Friday. Um, so, I don't like, think that's, that I don't think. I don't think that a lot of people, you know, particularly our, our, our white allies, realize the burden that that puts on us on a daily basis, right? George Floyd, Deanna right. Taylor, all of that. That is, you know, it weighs on you every day. I mean, in a, in a sense, being Canadian, we're a little bit shielded by it, but not by very much. It's right. not, you can't pretend that that's going to to save you in the end, because ultimately those attitudes, just like a lot of Trump attitudes, you know, have made their way up here. So, yes. uh, you know, there isn't, there isn't that shielding, but people have to realize that when they, they work with us too, that we're, we have this added bonus or burden of the news every day. So yeah, that made Thursday. And I'm glad that you mentioned it, but that made Thursday particularly difficult day to work through. Yes. I, you know, how many black clients do I have at the moment? One. One. Yes. Okay. How many people of color do I have at the moment? I'm trying to think. One. Again, so two people of color in total, right, yes. out, of, out of my current client. So, you know, and the market that we, that we work with, it's all going to be mainly white and mainly female. There's nothing wrong with that. I think that's fine. Um, we need to, what we need to, what's not fine about it is that we need to increase access ways of, of increasing access. And again, that, that sense of psychological safety that, that other types of people, right. Yes. Indigenous black people, they belong in the studio space yeah. along with, with their countrymen, their their European countrymen, right? They right. they belong in the space, but but again, I don't think you know they see us functioning every day, and they see us functioning well, you know, relatively well in this environment, and they think, oh well, there's nothing wrong because we're resilient. Because we're resilient, right? Exactly. But in reality, it that's a heavy burden. You have to wake up in the morning. You hear this. You wake up, or you come home at night. You hear that. And it's, it, it is an extremely heavy burden for us to bear on a daily basis. And 
you know, I, I mean, I look at my own, my own Instagram feed has become very protesty. <laughs> it's become very, very protesty. You used to have more fitness content on it. I want to try to strike that balance again to bring more fitness content back, but it's necessary to, to express my fears and my emotions and my aspirations yeah. on, on online in a way that's productive and that will motivate people and help people understand what I am going through. Yes. And I think that we, we can't be closed about the burden that we're carrying, right. right? We have to say to our allies and our friends that, you know, I feel this way because of this and we need to talk about it. And black men are the worst. When it comes to talking about feelings or emotional things or mental health, I don't know, you know, we, we are the worst. We are the worst yes. <laughs> when it yes. comes to doing that. There's just, there's just no two ways about it. <laughs> you couldn't sugarcoat that at all, eh? No, there's no way of sugarcoating that. Well, my colleagues at Hard House, Hard House students. Yes. When your person, so you see, and there you go. So they, they understand that. I mean, Hard House is, is gone as much as there was difficulty, you know, particularly uh, for me and career and everything else. They have started looking at, and this is a nice segue to yes. what Hard House is doing. Hard House is doing, uh, we, we have a collective called Being Well, and it's okay. directed specifically at Indigenous and and Black. Black people. And again, it's all about, you know, harvesting and cultivating skills, activities, using movement, using exercise, using our ancestral sort of um, uh access to our, our, our ancestral wellness. You know, there was always wellness in our yes. community and, and, you know, Afro-Caribbean communities in particular. There was always that sense of wellness. And again, tapping in on those things in order to, to have people in the university community feel well, particularly if you're Black, particularly yes. if you're Indigenous. Again, because it goes back to what we talked about earlier that imposter syndrome you're in this big white university again and you you feel kind of out of place right people you know there was a time where i might be the only black person in heart house yeah nobody else's because they were afraid to come in they didn't think it was for them they right. didn't realize right. that they had a, a place even my father when he was in university there he was a a gym manager he managed the weight room when he was yeah. he was there in the fifties, you know. Yeah. So there is a place, and there is a time, and people have to have to, you know, be able to come and feel welcome. And again, it even circles around to that that idea of psychological safety, yes. right? That's yeah. that feeling of that you belong. And mm -hmm. I think uh, we, you and I, and all of our black colleagues, we we first of all we have to understand that we do belong, and we're here. Yes. The next thing is to make our our comrades in arms believe that they belong in these places yeah. as well in these spaces doing their thing doing their mu movement whether it's pilates which is you know you know admittedly invented by a white german guy <laughs> right or whether it's african dance it's all good yes Right, yeah. and they can do all of it, or or Trinidad Parang Parang movement, or mm -hmm. all sorts of all sorts of cultural movement that we have. That you know, it's it's the idea of also decolonizing our thought process yes. and decolonizing you know our bodies to an extent. They're still very colonized because you know there was a I'm forgetting her name. There was a great. Um, conversation with uh, uh she was online and she's a trinidadian and she gave a ted talk okay. about about how you know whining and stuff during carnival was something that that is innate freedom joy movement for us but is very much shunned by by colonial society and how you know even the whole yes. idea of carnival moving up in trinidad was a uh, was uh, to make fun of the colonial society and to to express ourselves, right? Particularly yes, that we, yes. you know, as an island, you know, Trinidad had the rare fortune of being, you know, mostly free long before emancipation came. So yes, so the but still, it didn't matter. It we you had to fight to get into any sort of any sort of society. Still, so we would make fun of it. Mm -hmm. right? You know, yes. screw you. We're here. Right. This is yeah. what you guys, this is how ridiculous you guys look. And <laughs> here's what we're going to do. And, you know, Carnival is there ever since, really. Yeah. So it's, it's just, 
It's just so important that people have to understand, black people, indigenous people have to understand that these spaces are just as much for them yes. and just as much for them to grow and develop and then infuse their own Africanness, blackness, or in indigeneity into these spaces and then allow them to grow. That and is to brilliant. So oh. well said. <laughs> so you. well said. Uh, but man, listen, was... I've been doing this for years, and I've and like I said, there's yeah. you and I both have have come across so much, yes. right? And I'm really happy that you got a brick and mortar place now. It's going to be a new experience for you, absolutely, right? Oh man, it's yeah. But the struggle to get for you to even get to where you are, for for me to be able to be resilient enough that when you know 90% of your business evaporates, to start rebuilding it all over again, right? Yes. Um, that when you think about that that's a lot of willpower that's a lot of resilience that's a lot of confidence yes uh, in yes. ourselves right confidence in our own abilities that we have to uh uh transfer and and inculcate into the next generation of black and indigenous 100 percent. we are at 58 minutes Oh, wow. Jeez, we can talk for another two hours. <laughs> Honestly, we, t we could. And Martin, I, I'm so inspired by this conversation because like what you're saying resonates with me in such a way and it gives me such a fervor hmm. to move forward with everything that, that, that I'm doing and then to cheer you on and everything that you are doing because this time has given us so much, like it, it's, it's sad in some ways, but it's given me so much fuel for my fire in yep, other ways. Okay. You well, know? listen, so. we need to do this. And I can't say that I'm here without the help. You know, I started in fitness to the encouragement of a black woman who's a v very uh, well-known Toronto gym person and business associate, Joanne James. I don't think that without her role, and that's the last thing, if I'm going to say anything, yes. is about role modeling, okay? Yes, yes. You and I are in these positions now where we can role model to – other black men. It doesn't matter whether they're straight, they're gay, whatever, right? But we are there as role models. And we have to continue to to put ourselves forward as role models. And if it wasn't for having a black woman in fitness who is successful, right? In fact, it was Joanne who introduced me to the concept of Pilates and said, you know, maybe you should take a look at this and see. And this is way back, pardon me, in 1992, 1991. Yes. Okay. You should take a look at that because she was thinking she was managing the McGill Club mm -hmm. at the time before she broke out on her own uh, yes. in her own studio, and that's someone that you need to get on this conversation. I, I, I wrote it down, man. <laughs> Joanne, Joanne James, yeah. she is absolutely amazing, and I, I can't. Uh, she and uh, another person who was the faculty of, of physical education and health, Karen Lewis. So Karen, Karen Lewis was an ally as opposed to being as opposed to being black, but yeah, those yeah. two. If I didn't have the role model of Joanne James, I don't think I'd be as far as I am now. 15 seconds. Challenge accepted. <laughs>